When you ask people how important it is to mitigate existential risk, they don't just tell you it's important. Of course, it's important. They'll often give you very astronomical numbers for the importance of mitigating existential risk. Nick Bostrom says, even in a conservative scenario, the expected value of reducing risk by just a millionth of 1%, that's all, is 100 million lives the value of 100 million lives in expectation. And um, Hilary Graves and Will McCaskill in a famous paper, The Case for Strong Long-Termism, say that um, early asteroid detection efforts, the Space Guard survey in the 80s and the 90s, were saving lives at about 14 cents per life. I, I see a lot of debates about existential risk take these numbers for granted and move on for that. Please do not take these numbers for granted. If you do, you're, you are in for a world of suffering. One of the first things we need to do is to chip away at these numbers. So my aim here in this paper is to talk about three mistakes that people tend to make in calculating the value of existential risk mitigation. These are gonna be first focusing on cumulative risk over a very long period of time, instead of per unit risk in a century or a year or a decade or a manageable amount of time. These are gonna be ignoring risks in the background that are not affected by your interventions. And these are going to be ignoring the population dynamics by which human populations grow and evolve. I wanna argue these mistakes have had two effects on debates about risk. First, they've just mislocated the debate. If I'm right, a lot of the case for existential risk mitigation turns on things like population dynamics, like background risk, like cumulative risk that are not the focus of debates today. So we need to reset our debates to talk about these crucial parameters. And second, the value of existential risk mitigation is going to be overstated. All of these mistakes are things that tend to inflate the value of existential risk mitigation. And so when we correct them, you can still think the value of existential risk mitigation is high, but you can't be giving me numbers like the numbers I just quoted. We're also going to see some other important research questions that open up once we correct these mistakes. So that's the game plan. Let's look at the first mistake. Nick Bostrom says, Let's take what he calls a, a conservative scenario. We'll see in the third mistake, this is probably not a conservative scenario, but what he calls a conservative scenario in which humanity lasts for a billion years at uh, you know, a smaller population than we have now, a billion people. Then, okay, multiply through 10 to the ninth, 10 to the ninth is 10 to the 18 life years in the future. And if you normalize those to current lifespans, we're on you know the order of 10 to the 16th future lives. Bostrom says it follows an intervention which took just a millionth of 1%, that's all off of risk, would be just as good in expectation as something that saved 100 million people today. So he says, even if we use conservative estimates entirely ignoring space colonization, digital mines, we find the expected loss of an existential catastrophe is greater than the value of 10 to the 16th human lives. This implies the expected value of reducing risk by just a millionth of one percentage point is at least 100 times the value of a million human lives. It's pretty easy to see why Bostrom was tempted to say this. If we're saving in expectation 10 to the 16th lives with probability 10 to the minus eighth, then how many lives at expectation did we actually save? Well, 10 to the 16th times 10 to the minus 8, this 10 to the 8th, i.e. 100 million. And so that's where Bostrom's getting his claim. Not false. It's a little bit worse than false. It's badly misleading. And to see why this is misleading, we need to make two distinctions. The first is between absolute and relative readings of risk. Rarely we talk about risk reduction in an absolute way. This is subtractive risk reduction. So a 10% reduction would be subtracting F equals 10% from you know, the baseline R. Could be going from 80 to 70%, 20 to 10%, 10 to 
usually we think about relative reduction in a um, risk reduction in a relative manner. We're here, we're not taking away a fixed subtractive reduction, but a fixed percentage of the current amount. So here, a 10% reduction would be, well, taking 8% off of 80% to 72, taking 2% off of 20% to 18. Um, you know, if you want to take another 10% off of 18, you'd be taking 1.8% off and you'd be at 16.2, and these would all be 10% reductions. Now, if Ballstrom is going to credit himself with saving the entire future, he can't mean we're taking a 10 to the minus 8 reduction um, in a relative sense based on whether, you know, wherever risk is. Because if you look at this calculation, there's, there's no there's no current level of risk R in here. He needs to be doing absolute risk reduction, 10 to the minus 8. A little weird, just a little bit inflationary because you, relative risk reduction is going to normalize that by the current amount, but not terribly inflationary. So this is mostly a clarificatory point. The real point here is to think about cumulative versus per unit risk. Over a long period, say a, a billion years, because Boston says a billion, we got some cumulative risk of going extinct over this period, call that RC for cumulative risk. And we survive with the remainder probability, one minus the cumulative risk. Okay, but chop it up into a reasonable amount, like a century or a year. In every unit, I'll just call a unit a century. We've got some per unit risk, call it RU, of extinction. Here and throughout, I'm focusing on extinction over non-extinction catastrophes. It, I, I would need another paper to talk about non-extinction catastrophes. Uh, the problem is if you ask how cumulative risk over a billion years is related to per unit risk over a century, um, so read this from right to left. Well, in a given century, the risk is RU that you go kapoof. So it's one minus RU is the probability you make it through that century. You got a bunch of centuries, call them N centuries, in this case, literally 10 million centuries. So what's the probability you make it through every one of them? Well, those are independent events. So one minus RU to the N is the probability you make it through all of them. So what's the probability you don't make it through all of them? One minus all that, and that's your cumulative risk. Don't fuss about this equation. There's one and only one thing you need to know. Namely, we're taking a quantity. Okay, it's small. Maybe the probability we go extinct in a single century. And we're raising it to an exponent, which if you know how exponents behave after n equals 20 or 30 or 50, we're in trouble here. And that exponent is, is, is 10. Million. Um, and, and so what's this effect going to do, even if the thing in parentheses is really small, um, I, I, excuse me, is, is, is really large, um, raising it to 10 millionth is going to make it um, really small, and, and RC is quickly going to go to, you know, one minus something small is about one, i.e. almost certain risk of catastrophe. But the problem for Ballstrom is he's looking at cumulative risk. He's not looking at per unit risk. He's looking at cumulative risk, and he's stuck with this n equals 10 million, and this is just going to get him into some trouble here. Why is this misleading? So if we really wanted to make an absolute reduction of just 1 millionth of 1%, that's all in cumulative risk, then after that, cumulative risk would have to be at least 1 millionth of 1% away from certain deaths. So, okay, that's the best scenario for Ballstrom. Work it out. What would this require in the very best case? Per unit risk would have to be about one in a million, 1 1.6 in a million or lower. Every century without fail, if we got some spikes, we're in trouble. So, so Ostrom puts this in terms of absolute cumulative risk reduction. He says, well, in those terms, here's all we need, one millionth of 1% off of risk. But in more revelatory relative per unit risk, what do we need to do? We need to drive the risk to about one in a million, um, whereas many effective ultras think it's one in 10 or larger this century. We need to drive it there every century without fail. A couple of spikes, we're in trouble. So when we phrase things this way, we are seeing that this just one in a millionth of a percent framing is really not getting to the heart of what's going on. But so why do I think we need to frame things in terms of relative and per unit risk? Well, first, the numbers are just more perspective. You can't say, oh, we're just looking at one millionth of one percentage point here. We're looking at five orders of magnitude here. 
And we're looking at five orders of magnitude over 10 million centuries without fail. And also we want an action relevant quantity. We can't really act in a meaningful way to reduce cumulative risk. We can reduce risk in our year, maybe in our century, maybe in our millennium, but we're not directly acting on risk a billion years hence. So we really should evaluate our acts by their effects on, well, what they actually change is risk in our century. Okay, that's the first mistake, um, focusing on cumulative rather than per unit or per century or per year risk. The second mistake is ignoring background risk. So here I'm going to look at a um, model due to Piers Millet and Andrew Snyder Beatty, um, one of the few um, published academic papers on bio-risk, and this is by some of the leading people in EA biosecurity today. So they say, take just standard government cost effectiveness metrics, and they're going to argue on conservative assumptions that biosecurity, you know, of the existential kind is cost effective on standard government metrics. Now, one thing you might say is, look, everything's cost effective on standard government metrics. That doesn't mean it beats give well, and we'll, we'll get back to that. But let, let, let's focus for now on, on their model. And their model is going to have four parameters. First is going to be the cost of the intervention. And here, this was in the FTX or just pre-FTX days. They were imagining um, $250 billion being spent on existential biosecurity. Hopefully, we're not going to spend that much. Then they're going to have a risk model. The risk model is just going to tell you on a per century basis how many existential catastrophes of a biological kind would we have until we did something about it. And they're gonna give you three different models um, there. I, I blogged about these models. I don't trust these models, but that's that's another, um, another talk. Then they're gonna say, how many life years would we save by stopping a catastrophe? And they're, they're gonna make the Bostrom mistake here. We'll get back to this mistake, but they're gonna give you a kind of Bostromian estimate. They're gonna say, well, if you know nothing goes wrong, we're gonna have 10 billion people in the future. Bostrom said 1 billion, but they say a million years instead of a billion years. So you multiply that through and um, you get 10 to the 14th life or 10 to the 16th um, life years. And then they say, okay, we spend $250 billion. We take some percentage R off of risk. This is relative risk reduction. Good for them. They're not doing absolute risk reduction. Um, wait, sorry. I think they are. Apologies. It was a, it was a while Um since I wrote this, yes, they definitely are doing um, absolute risk reduction here. Um, so what's R? They're going to set it to 1% is nice. They're being pretty modest here. And they're going to say, even with these modest numbers, um, the biosecurity intervention we're looking at is robustly cost effective. They're going to look at three models here of the number of existential bio threats we face per century. The first model was um, just from a conference at FHI. Um, this model is going to estimate that we face between 0 0.005 and 0 0.02 existential catastrophes from biological causes every century, um, unless we do anything about it. The other models are um, a bit more modest. We have a power law extrapolation, and we have an extrapolation based on a gain of function research report. You, you can read my, my blogs about these extrapolations, and these are going to give you range estimates that are a little bit smaller. Then they're going to calculate the cost effectiveness of your interventions. They're going to say, well, look, what's the cost is C, $250 billion. What's the benefit? Well, the number of lives saved times the reduction in the probability of those lives not happening. So this is their way of doing cost over benefit. And you can just push through and calculate in these models. Model one, you're at about 12 cents to $5, not per life, but per life year. Um, the worst model, you're about 31 cents to $1,600 per life year. And you know the median model, you're at about 18 to $50 per life year. And so they're going to say, look, this is robustly cost effective across every model. This passes every United States government cost effectiveness metric we've ever applied. Now, um, there's a lot that you could say here. Um, one thing that I'm going to set aside, although it's kind of going to come up, 
is that estimating the number of lives in the future and estimating the riskiness of the future separately is not a good idea because the number of lives in the future depends um, most heavily on the riskiness of the future. If the future is risky, there are fewer lives in the future. So this is like not a good way to um, estimate things. Um, and another thing you could push on is the give well line. Of course, even if these numbers are cost effective by US estimates, something like $1,600 a life year is not beating malaria nets. So we're not in as good territory as we would think here. Um, but roughly, let's talk about two mistakes that are coming up here. And the first is ignoring risks in the background. By background risks, I mean what I meant by them in my existential risk pessimism paper published as um, high risk, low reward, a challenge to the astronomical value of existential risk mitigation. I just mean risks in the background that you're not affecting by your current intervention. Um, so make an independence or a separability assumption. Um, uh, yeah, this is. Um, probably going to hold to a reasonable degree of approximation. It's not perfect, but to a reasonable degree of approximation, risk in this century is risk from biological causes plus risk from non-biological causes. And um, if that's right, remember, we're intervening on B, the biological causes, but we're not intervening on the uh, non-biological causes. So we're taking um, a relative risk reduction. I'm, I'm going to do this in relative terms. Um, of 1%, but we're not taking a relative risk production on B plus N total risk. We're taking a relative risk reduction on B is by a risk by 1%. And if we look at the effect of that, that's nowhere near as good as Millet and Snyder Beatty want it to be. And the reason it's not is because we can't do anything about this darn number N. And so how many expected life years are there going to be in the future? Well, they've got a model on which every century has 10 billion people or 1 trillion 10 to the 12 life years. As long as we make it to the century, we make it to the century as long as we survive. We survive with one, you know, probability one minus the risk, the first century, one minus the risk squared, we make it to three, two centuries, three centuries, four centuries, and we've got on their model a maximum of a million years or 10,000 centuries. So that's how many life years in expectation we've got in the future. And crucially, what we want to know is how many more life years do we get after our intervention than we had pre-intervention. So, you know, this is just um, when we've changed this number to um, the lower risk rather than the higher risk. And you can push this through in the appendix. We've got, unsurprisingly, this 10 to the 12th factor. And I, I haven't multiplied this through. Don't get on my case for not simplifying fractions. That's to show you, you know, what we're doing. We're looking at a trillion life years a century. And the probabilified component, we've got, you know, a B up here. And this is nice because if bio risk is high, this quantity goes up. Um, but we've got kind of an R squared on the bottom. And that's bad because overall risk R is counting not once, but twice here. And that's bad, right? Because overall risk has got this end thing that we can't do anything about. And if we're counting N twice, this, this is not good. Um, and in particular, it's not good because many effective altruists think overall risk R is, is quite high, in which case overall risk R is going to be much, much, much higher than any of the numbers we saw here. And so it's going to dominate the calculation. Just by way of illustration, I've taken kind of a Toby Ord style estimate, risk at about 20% per century. And also a more conservative estimate, risk at about 1% per century. This is overall risk. And then I've split that up into its biological component, just read off the Millet and Snyder BD models and its non-biological component. The, the only downside is, of course, this is 2%. So I had to uh, to drop this down to 1% um, in this column. But otherwise, it's just it's straightforward. Um, if risk is 20% per century, the Millet and Snyder BD cost-effectiveness analyses are just radically off, ignoring background risk is going to be a major mistake. And this is the point I made in my X-risk pessimism paper. The best we're getting is about $50 to $200 per life year from the bio-risk interventions. We can be as bad as twelve dollars to $600,000 per life year. And we're probably about as bad as like seven dollars to $20,000 per life year. So all of these models 
are falling radically below GiveWell is probably, you know, 50 or 100 or $200 a life year at the very worst, even ignoring knock-on effects, which you shouldn't. Um, so if you have high levels of background risk and you just plug them back into Millet and Snyder BD models, that's the end of the debate. Give well wins. But now you say, well, David, if we have low background risk, you told us in your other paper, that's not going to do much. And that didn't do much. And so we're almost back where we started. Okay, that would be a saving grace, but now we need something. We've already got something that punishes the high risk case. Now we need something that punishes the low risk case and we've already found it. So remember, just like we said with Bostrom, we're realistically talking about spending a bunch of money to reduce risk in our century or in our decade or in our millennium. We're not you know, claiming this intervention is gonna chop 1% off of risk. Um, in very distant century. That's just not feasible. We're saying, how good would it be to take a relativist reduction of 1% in bio-risk, you know, not non-biological risk, that's the first mistake, this century. So this century, we're taking 1% off of risk, but next century, the risk is going to be right back where it was. We're only doing this in this century. And if you do this, this is just correcting the first mistake. Well, how many life years are there in the future? in expectation. We want to know how many were there before the intervention and how many were there after intervention when we chopped 1% off of our bio risk in um, this century only. And you, you can crunch through, we still got this 10 to the 12th is, you know, about a, a trillion life years a century. Um, but now instead of a kind of a B over R squared term, we've got a B over R term. Um, and, and this is exactly the punishment we needed. So remember, in the high R case, we're not really worried about it, you know, in R squared, because, um, you know, R squared is like one over 25. Um, but in the low case, um, R squared is going to be 100 times as good as R. So when we're only dividing by one instead of two R's, we're really going to take a nosedive here. And so what did we do? We took uh, a nosedive of about two orders of magnitude. And now cost effectiveness again, you know, still the the the, the probability models from Milton Snyder Beatty. Um, in the 20% risk per century case, we, we've been punished again, but we were already in trouble there. But crucially, now in the 1% risk per century case, on well, the first model, we're at about $13 to $50 a life, is maybe keeping pace with GiveWell, although then with knock-on effects of GiveWell, probably not. And in the other models, we're falling very, very, very far short of give well prices um, of, of a statistical um, life here. And, um, you know, when we're getting up here, maybe even U.S. government prices of a statistical life here. So lesson is two things. Um, new lesson, don't um, ignore background risk. If you're intervening on one risk, but not the other risks, that's going to matter a lot. Um, we saw in some of my other work that if you don't think you can drive most risks very low, driving one risk very low is actually not as good as you think it is. And then we just have a reminder, there's a distinction between cumulative and per unit risk. We're intervening on per unit risk. And when we write our interventions in those terms, we're taking much less credit for our actions and um, not getting the same kind of value. Okay, so the last mistake is ignoring population dynamics. And here I'm really drawing on research out of um, the Population and Wellbeing Initiative, people like Dean Spears, like Maya Eden, like Mike Chiruso at UT Austin, and um, Eden just met, moved to Zurich. So I'll, I'll give you some of the research, but I would really encourage you to read some of their work that I'm citing, which is excellent. These people very much know what they're talking about. They know this literature and um, they're serious demographers and economists worth engaging with. But Will McCaskill says famously in What We Are the Future, future people count. Yep, future people count. There could be a lot of them. Focus on there could be a lot of them. And we can make their lives go better. So elsewhere, I've worried about them making their lives go better. But here, let's focus on there could be a lot of them. <laughs> 
a lot of people are going to back that up, just estimating the future population size by doing two things. They're going to give you the carrying capacity of the region. How many people could we fit on Earth or in the solar system or in the Milky Way or in the Virgo supercluster? And then they're going to say, duration-wise, how long could we keep those people there? And they're going to multiply carrying capacity by duration to get an estimate of the number of future lives. Um, now, of course, this isn't a perfect way to estimate for a number of reasons. One is, of course, it takes time to fill the carrying capacity. I'll pick on it for some other ways. Um, but this is the kind of an estimate you're going to see. So the Bostrom estimate we saw at the beginning of this paper said, look, Imagine we can hold a billion lives, 10 to the ninth, for a billion years, 10 to the seven centuries. We multiply through um, 10 to the ninth times 10 to the seventh gives you an estimate of 10 to the 16th future lives on Earth. Um, Will McCaskill and what the we are the future does exactly the same kind of thing, um, adds a zero to carrying capacity, drops a two on duration. So we're, um, you know, adding a five to the number of future lives. And Graves and McCaskill are going to do this in both their Earthbound models and their solar system models. And their Milky Way models, they're going to have carrying capacities going all the way up to 10 to the 25th lives per century. Look up the Latin for that. That is a big number. And durations going up. We're getting um, 10 to the 11th, not 10 to the 11th years, 10 to the 13th years, 10 to the 11th centuries, getting us pretty high estimates of the number of future lives. And so McCaskill says in what we owe the future, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good point. He says, these are big numbers. He says, draw a stick figure to be about 10 billion humans. He says, what is the past of humanity? About 10 stick figures. What's the present? One stick figure. What's the future? Even on an earthbound model, it's five billion, five, um, million stick figures. So he draws these stick figures and he draws them and he draws them and he draws them and there's seven or eight pages worth of stick figures. And then he says, okay, you you get the point. It keeps it keeps going. All right, so one way I'd want to push on these interventions is to incorporate background risk. And this is something I pushed in the second mistake today that I pushed in my existential risk pessimism paper. If you build in levels of background risk, these estimates take a nosedive. So as expected, if you build in like a 20% per century risk, these estimates really take a pounding. And, um, you know, they're not going very far above carrying capacity because the this whole 10 to the 11th century thing is not realistic. Um, but even if you have like a 1% or even 0.1% level of background risk, these estimates are still taking a pretty significant dip. Um, so the lesson here, just like we saw with Millet and Snyder Beatty, is a lot of times people are making two or three mistakes at once. Um, and these mistakes gain power when they're made or when they're corrected in combination. So I'm not going to talk more about background risk in these models, but just remember that what I'm saying here is not the only thing wrong with these models. Instead, I want to think about population dynamics. So this idea of asking a technological question about carrying capacity, how many people could we hold in a region? And making an inference about demographics or population, how many people will we hold, is not the way we study um, population. It's not the way we study demographics in economics departments and social science departments. We know a lot about human populations and how they evolve, and we do not think this is primarily a technological question. Demographers almost universally think Malthus was wrong. So the Malthusian said, look, we breed like rabbits. This is how we model rabbits um, until we run out of resources, until the population is about as high as we can support. And then if we run out of land, we run out of food, that's when we stop breeding. That's going to get you up to carrying capacity quickly. But everybody thinks population dynamics are not Malthusian anymore. The earth could hold way more than 8 billion people right now. The wealthiest countries that can hold the most people are the least likely to be increasing their population. So resources are not driving population anymore. And because of that, we had a pretty impressive period of population growth. It's now thought that population growth is going to be zero, probably negative by 2100, maybe a couple of decades before. We're going to peak at just a bit higher than we're at now, 10 to the 12th billion people. 
what's going to happen after that? You you know, I think now that I'm skeptical about predicting the future. And to the extent that we are comfortable predicting the future, take it or leave it. Everybody who goes out to 2300 expects continued decline of human population until at least 2300. Um, and there's no in principle reason we ever have to see a resurgence of population. Population declines if the fertility rate is a little bit more lower than um than, than two. And um there's nothing about this magic number two that's set in stone or is self rebounding. I mean, if, if that's right, we're not talking 10 million stick figures. We're talking a lot fewer people in the future. So here's a study out of the Population Wellbeing Initiative as a demography run initiative. Um, Dean Spears, Mike Jeruso, they know their demographics. They know their long-termism. They say, imagine fertility rates bottom out, just you know, a little bit below. Um, replacement is, is two births per woman. Just bottom out at about 1.66 births per woman. What's going to happen? Here's births per year, and here's where we're at. We're at a pretty high number. Very, very, very rapidly births per year fall. And the projected population is going to be not about um, 5 million stick figures in the figure, uh, future. It's going to be about um, 30 billion people, about three stick figures in the entire human future. And this doesn't really matter um, the exact numbers we're at. If we take an asymptotic fertility of 1.8 is South America right now, 1.66 is the US is what they used. Europe's even lower, 1.5. East Asia is 1.0. South Korea is 1.2. South Korea is 1.0. All of these are putting us in the range of about two to three future stick figures of human population. None of these numbers is going to be remotely close to 5 million. And certainly the non-earthbound models that were way higher than 5 million stick figures were not in that ballpark, not for technological reasons, just for demographic reasons. Um, so you might say, okay, David, um, I think Malthus is going to eventually resurge. I grant that technology is not currently the limiting factor in human population, but in the future, technology is going to save us. So in the future, in the paper, I go through some things and Caruso and Spears go through some things. Demographers are pretty skeptical as a group of this way of talking. We've been promised for centuries that technology is going to increase demographics. We've seen, um, Technologies that make it much easier to raise kids, washing machines, disposable diapers. We've seen an increase in the income, a decrease in working hours. Uh, we've become wealthier. None of this has countered population decline. It's concurred with population decline. So I, I think a lot of demographers are pretty skeptical that technology alone is going to reverse population decline. Even if you are a Malthusian, and I do not think you should be a Malthusian, even if you're a Malthusian, you should still care about population dynamics. To see how you should care, let's take about as optimistic a model of technology as we can find, and one that incorporates a Malthusian population dynamic. It just assumes carrying capacity gets hit very quickly um, when it's available. This is a model by um, a former colleague of mine, Christian, Christian Tarzny. I think many of you know this paper. This model assumes it takes a thousand years to start settling the stars. Okay, that's a good modest assumption. When we do it, we go very fast. We go a tenth of the speed of light. We don't just go in one direction or all the cool directions or a couple directions. We don't go in a two dimensional plane. We go in an expanding sphere around the earth in every direction at once. That's a lot of ships. Every direction at once, we push the human frontier a tenth of the speed of light. And we do this until the very end of time. We do this either until we become extinct with some constant extinction probability, call it R. This is just done on a per year basis. So remember, I'm doing per year, not per century, if the numbers are going to look weird. Um, the only other thing is, of course, there might be an upper bound to the habitability of the universe, TF. He calls it the eschatological bound. Uh, don't worry about this. This is so high that... Um, you know, existential risk mitigation becomes astronomically valuable long before this. So you don't really need to care about the precise bound here. 
then what's the value model? So he says, okay, what's the value of life on earth right now? About 6 billion qualies, he thinks, um, is about where we are. He says, just keep that fixed in the future. Suppose we settle some stars. He says, okay, all the habitable planets, maybe they're not going to be quite as good as Earth. They're not that well adapted for us, but let's put them at about 5% as good as Earth. So 300 million qualies. Um, and here's the Malthusian assumption, right? As soon as we settle a star, we're crediting ourselves with um, 300 million qualies. We're just getting up to a reasonable population capacity um, to, to live those qualies quite quickly. Now he says, look, let's compare a couple of interventions. Near-termist intervention, he thinks for a million dollars will get you about 10,000 qualies. Um, I think with knock-on effects, it might be a little higher, but I, I don't want to fuss about you know, an order of, of magnitude here. And a long-termist intervention, he's going to do it in terms of absolute risk reduction. I don't like that he did this. Um, but other, otherwise, it's it's a fine, it's a pretty... Um, worked out number. He's got a footnote explaining how he got this number. He thinks a million dollars will get you about um, twice 10 to the minus 14th in an absolute fraction off of risk um, just within the next millennium. And then, you know, after the, I, I would have liked century, but fine, he said millennium. And then, and then the next um, millennia have to take care of themselves. And he asks, under what condition would the long-term is intervention L be the near-term is intervention N? We just need one more function. So remember, we're expanding at breakneck pace in a sphere around Earth. And so we need to know if I've gone X distance from Earth um, in that sphere, how many habitable stars are there around Earth? And he gives us his function N of X is, is, is going to do it piecewise in three pieces because the stars get less dense around Earth. Um, so N of X is, you know, how many stars are in a ball of radius X around Earth. And if you want to see the Harry function, you, you can see the Harry function. Okay, so what's the expected value of the near-termist intervention? Well, it's, it's 10,000 qualities. I told you what's the expected value of the long-termist intervention. Well, it's a P-wise improvement in your chance of beginning this grand settlement project through the stars. What's the value of the grand settlement project? Well, we're going to do it until the heat death of the universe. Doesn't really matter the upper bound here, but we're going to do it for a very long time unless... We go extinct with constant probability R per year. So just discount for extinction in the standard exponential way. When we're not extinct, how good is it to be alive? Well, we're getting some value from Earth, VE, with 6 billion qualies. Every settled star, we're getting 5% of that, 300 million qualies. And how many stars have we hit? Well, by time T, we've gone speed S is a tenth speed of light. So, you know... 0.1 light years times T. And in a ball of 0.1 light years times T around Earth, there are N of um, ST, N of um, 0.1 light years T. Um, stars of habitable nature around the Earth. And, you know, these are all given as value V of S. So, you know, quickly the um, V of S term after this gets to about 20 is going to start picking up steam and, and it's going to start dominating. Then we say, um, when would the expected value of the long-termist intervention be the near-termist intervention? When, well, per year risk has to be below 0.00135. Um, per century, I think it's a little more natural way to report it. Just remember the rounding is slightly different here is going to be 1.34% lower. Okay, so first thing to note here, this isn't 20%. This isn't 16%. This is 1.3%. If you think we got 20% risk a, year, a century, 5% risk a century, even this optimistic story says fun give well. But if you have a story on which per century risk is about 1.3% or lower with, you know, very few blips, then this is a model that's going to recommend the long term as intervention. Okay, but th th this model says nothing about population. And even if you're doing the, the kind of science fiction combined with Malthus, you still have to say something about population. Here's, I think, about the most optimistic thing you could say about population. Imagine once you get to a planet, we need to settle the planet. We need to have some kids. How long does that take? Maybe about a thousand years to get a planet in shape. 
Okay, now Thusian's story about migration is not that as soon as we hit a planet, we keep going. Why would you leave a perfectly good planet um, at a tenth the speed of light, about five light years to get to the next planet? This is a 50-year journey, so you are not taking this journey unless you really are out of resources on your planet. So what's the Malthusian story? The Malthusian story, which is the one you know we need, is uh, eventually resources after about a thousand years get pretty scarce and all the second suns um, take flight for nearby planets. I do not think they would go in all directions. I think they'd just go in one direction, which would scuttle the story right there. But fine, let's have them go in all directions towards the nearest star systems. They're going to go on average about five light years, and they're going to do this about every thousand years. So what's the speed of extension? It's not 0.1 C, where you know C is the speed of light. It's 5,000 C, where C is the speed of light. Um, and this is really, really, really bad because you know that this n function, the the number of stars in a, in a um a sphere of radius. Well, how how does a, a sphere expand with its radius? It expands cubically. So if you drop the radius down, um, you're dropping n down. Um, you know, not by the difference, but by the cube of the difference. And so this um n quantity is not going to take off anywhere near as fast. Um, what happens if you just leave the model alone, but you put this in for s instead of a 0.1? Now, for the long-termist intervention to be better, risk per year has to be pretty low. It's got to be below 0. 0.0000145, or on per century terms, about um, 0.145% per century, which is, given the stories that long-termists are telling us, is a pretty low number. I think a lot of long-termists might not believe that number. Um, and just remember, it's... Um, well, one way to put it is risk has to be about 10 times lower than it had to be before. Another way to put it is the level of risk that previously made long-termism best is now actually making long-termism 500 times worse than near-termism. So even on very optimistic stories um, that are not fitting very well with modern demography, we still need to think about demographics and we're still going to take a hit from population dynamics. Okay, what follows from all of this? We've seen three mistakes in the moral math of existential risk, focusing on cumulative versus per century risk. We saw Bostrom does it. We saw ignoring background risk in one of my previous papers, but we also saw Millet and Snyder Beatty do it, as well as making the Bostrom mistake. And then we saw neglect of population dynamics combined with, again, ignoring um, background risk in, in some models um, by Bostrom, by McCaskill, by, by Graves and McCaskill. One thing that follows is something I really wish I'd said in my X-risk pessimism paper more clearly. Namely, if you look at the cumulative risk models, the higher the level of risk is in the background, the less valuable it is to reduce risk almost across the board. This is really counterintuitive because unless we say anything more, and maybe we should, I think in a lot of situations, we should say more. If that's right, long-term should be praying for low risk. Don't write a book like The Precipice. Long-term should be saying risk is really low. And because it's so low, it's very important to preserve the world because the world's going to be great as long as we don't um, mess it up. And short-term, it should be writing books like The Precipice. Short-term, it should be saying we live in such a risky world that we shouldn't be trying to preserve the future. We should be trying to live well, well, we're still alive. Now, again, I think we should say a little bit more, and this won't be the dialectic, but if we don't say anything more, everybody's been arguing for the wrong side. And so there are more things we can say. One of them that I've written about in the past is the time of perils hypothesis would not um, reverse this dialectic, but at least um, mute the dialectic. And um, we can talk about that in other work. Something about digital minds, I'm a little bit reluctant to say. So we, we saw in section four that population dynamics really matters and that this could be a huge drag because just because humans could have a lot of kids doesn't mean um, we're going to want to have a lot of kids. I could have kids right now. I could have a lot of kids right now. I don't have kids right now. I'm focusing on focusing on other things. And one thing that's going to follow that you're going to see in work by Maya Eden and Gustav Alexandri is coming out in the GPI long-termism volume 
by Dean Spears and Mike Jerusso is also coming out in the GPI long-termism volume, is instead of working on X risk, you might want to work on just increasing the size of the future population. So boring things like um, trying to reduce population declines on many of these models could actually be at least as good um, especially in a risky world, it can be at least as good as long-termist interventions. The thing I'm a little reluctant to um, explore too much is, of course, human population dynamics are not very Malthusian. Um, but that doesn't mean that no species have Malthusian dynamics. Non-human animals have Malthusian dynamics. But also digital minds could have uh, Malthusian dynamics, and in, in particular, they could have Malthusian dynamics if, if we programmed them to do the the expansionist kind of program that um, Tars and is keeping in mind. Um, and so, one way to read the last section of the paper would be as kind of a stealth argument for um, replacing humans with a Malthusian population of um, digital minds very quickly. I'm not entirely happy with that implication. That is not what I would be recommending here, but it is important to know that this would be one advantage of um, digital minds here. Finally, we need to think about coordination problems. So we've seen across this paper that you need to drive down not just risk in a year, not just risk in a century, you got to drive down cumulative risk over a very long time. And that means Every century has got to cooperate to drive its own risk down very low with no free riders. A couple of people like, oh, I don't know, this century, if you're an effective altruist, you think we're running unacceptably high existential risks. One or two free riding centuries are going to ruin the game. Coordinating for 100 million years or a billion years or a trillion years around low levels of risk is really hard. It's hard for a couple of reasons. For the, the, the risk level we're targeting is very low. Long-termists think risk is one in 10, one in five right now. We want to drop it down to one in a million. And there's just a very, very big ask. It's also a big ask because every generation only bears a small fraction of the cost. Um, if most of the cost of the risk we're running right now is to our descendants and not to us, then um, it's a hard coordination problem because my incentives are not what they should be. It's very hard because people aren't that patient and they aren't that altruistic. They don't care about as much about the future as they should. And they don't care about other people as much as they should. And so this is going to make coordinating here hard. And it's the hardest coordination problem you've ever seen because it's really hard to sanction people. So let's say we run a bunch of risk and future generations are mad. Why do we run risks? What are they going to do? Dig up our graves, blaspheme our memories? This is a little bit of a punishment, but it's really hard to use standard methods of sanction, of reward, of punishment um, to get people in line here. So I think that framing existential risk as a intergenerational coordination problem can be both very um, important in terms of understanding what's going on, but it can also be... Um, uh, a bit of a reminder of the difficulty of the problem. All right, let me stop here. You'll be able to read the paper on my website, um, dthorstad.com, on my blog, Reflective Altruism, should be out with the journal soon. And um, I will um, pause the video here.